Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Diffuse Congruence. It's episode 91. We are here with Harvez Ehman, yeah, the founder <laughs> himself. And uh, and we're here with myself, Omar Ansari, yeah. joined by special guest Essan Sayed of the Bay Area. Harvez is going to do a quick intro. Yeah, intro. we are delighted to have uh, Essan Uncle. Uh, but Essan Sayed is a longtime member and leader of the Muslim community in the San Francisco Bay Area. He has uh, spent time serving on the board of various Muslim organizations here in the Bay Area as well as outside. Um, he is retired from a career in civil engineering with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, prior to moving to the Bay Area, um, as an uncle spent a time in the Middle East and Ohio and Pennsylvania. He holds a, uh, I'm sorry, first he immigrated here in 1967 to um, complete his master's degree in civil engineering at Mississippi State University. Um, Asanakul was born in Hyderabad, uh, India, which is also happens to be where me and Omar's parents come from as well. Uh, studied in an Urdu medium school, which I definitely want to talk about that, and did his BS in engineering at, of course, the world-renowned Usmania University in Hyderabad. So we are absolutely delighted, Asanakul, to have you on the show. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Thank you. So, um, you know, one of the things we were talking about off air prior to recording, but, you know, um, I mean, you know, we've been blessed to have 90 plus episodes now in the bank, as it were, or in the catalog of diffuse congruence. But interestingly enough, or I should say, shockingly enough, one of the things we haven't really kind of discussed or delved into is sort of what I describe as kind of the quintessential immigrant experience of immigrating here, especially in the late 60s, mm -hmm. post-1965 wave of immigration that took place that my parents, Omer's parents, certainly you, oh. uncle, came as a part of. Um, but so I, I definitely want to capture some of that experience and what that was like coming to America um, back in the late 60s. But I guess before... We, we, we really talk about you as an immigrant to America. Um, maybe talk a little bit about your background in Hyderabad and okay. how it was growing up. Yeah, I, I was, uh, my father was a professor of uh, Arabic in Osmania University, a mid-income mid group. And we are eight brothers and sisters living in a one-room house. Wow. It was a very difficult thing for us at the time. And... Uh, uh, when uh, I was, my father is always sick, very sick because of his acute illness. Uh, he passed away when I was in, in first year of engineering. I was uh, 20 years old at mm. that time. And, uh, you know, then we have the large family without any income at that time. But Alhamdulillah, we managed. Uh, I finished my engineering and then I was the last, it was last thing on my itinerary that I, I would be coming to America. Uh, because, you know, the resources, the money was not there. So I waited to get a job in, uh, in, in Hyderabad. But because, you know, there were, at that time, there was a big dam project going on, Nagarjuna Sagar Dam. Mm. And there was a big demand for civil engineers. And we were only 15 engineers passed that year. In spite of that, I don't know what, what the reason was. They never gave me a job until six months I was without job. Mm. Finally, Alhamdulillah, I got a job. I saved some money. Uh, and uh, I was hoping that, and, and six months into my job, they have a big retrenchment, what they call it, layoff. Mm. So I was the junior most, they, they laid me off. Without any uh, future in mind, I started applying for engineering just to case, see that how, how it plays out. I landed admission. I was looking for the cheapest university in America at that mm. time. And Mississippi State was the cheapest. My uh, uh, semester fees was like $250. So, master's degree. And Alhamdulillah, I landed admission, but I had only money enough for traveling wow. to so, America. So, like, I guess a little bit about, like, you know, in Hyderabad, like you yeah. said, I mean, modest income, although your father was uh, a faculty member uh -huh. at the univer at Usmania University. Um you know, um, what was it about engineering or was that sort of just an expectation that you studied engineering as a young no, man? The, or? There, you know, the, you must understand that even today in Desi's culture, yeah. there are only <laughs> two professions they go for, either, either medicine or engineering. The rest, they think, is failure. <laughs> That's right. So everybody goes after that. And you can imagine Gee. there were 50,000 students competing for on, uh, 250 seats in engineering college. Wow. And for us, on merit only, 25 seats only. Right. 
so we are we have to have a perfect score in order to land admission so alhamdulillah i did very well in the, in the exam and uh, i i was sixth in rank in ranks in the entire state mm. so i landed admission but uh, more than that you know you are talking about mid income problem yeah my father only earned 500 rupees per month at that time right and uh, you know family affair at that time you know things were very cheap and reasonable of course and we were living in our grandfather's house which was almost free yeah so now i went to the same arabic department same room where my father used to sit and i asked the professor over there in fact to to just to elaborate that we established a gold medal in his name my father's name in the department yes, so we we went there and i asked this how much you are earning now mm-hmm. and i always fell on the ground when he said that he earns 125000 rupees per month versus 500 500 <laughs> so they are maintaining cars and they are they are very affluent now yeah got it so alhamdulillah you know we managed and uh, i landed admission and what happened was i was in a went to a wedding friend's wedding and I was talking to him you know what what should i do you know i have uh, admission but i don't have any money or anything he said that you know try every every possible means and see if you can do something so i one of my uncles long last uncle he was living in beirut at the time lebanon he was a doctor so i wrote to him that please you know help me lo give me some loan after a while i got a letter back you normally you never used to reply that thing and he gave me he said you go ahead and i'll I'll send you the money over there. Mm-hmm. So uh, on that promise, I just bought a ticket, and I went to I directly went to Washington D.C. That's 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 the, that's the ticket I had at at that time. So you landed in Washington in Washington D.C. And no, actually I came to New York. Uh-huh. This is another you know this is a very interesting story. Were you already married at the time? No, no, oh, I was okay. not. You married. were single. I was single. Yeah, I was uh, you know to understand that back then, America has a very special relationship with Pakistan. Mm. India I was not on their list. That's right. So very few visas they used to grant. Very difficult to get a grant. Mm. Pakistanis used to get they, you know in droves mm. the visas mm. at the time. Mm. Uh, when I went to Madras, if that's where the uh, embassy. embassy was, right. The there were about 10 or 11 people that day applying for the visa mm. for going to America. They all he all rejected all of them. And mine was the only one he approved that day. Wow. So I was really thrilled, and I came. And the another problem is getting a train from Hyderabad to Bombay. Yeah, was you have to book very well in advance. Mm. My brother-in-law used to work in 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 railway. He bought a ticket for me, and we in fact I I came to Bombay, and uh, all night long I could not sleep because the berth which he reserved for me. Yeah, there was another three hundred and fifty pound man. was already sleeping in that so there was no room for me so i i came back to bombay and he spent all day in bombay and in and went to the british airways at the time this boac plane mm-hmm. and then they took me to airport at midnight mm-hmm. and that's where i i went to and and that was the first time in my life i flew in in a plane So were you the first person from your family to come abroad? From direct my family, yes. Yeah, okay, yes. Okay. I'm the, you know, the first one. Yeah. What was it about America that attracted you in particular? You know, there were two choices I have yeah. at the time. Yeah. You know, Russia and America were competing in India. Right. And Russian uh, they established a friendship university in the name of Lumumba who was murdered by western forces. Mm. and uh, they were offering scholarships mm. free education mm. for top notch students so i had either i could go to th- apply to there and go there or go come to america and spend my money mm. uh then it occurred to me that um, you know russia is not my choice because there is no freedom of you know i mean yeah. religion or you know even the speech or anything mm-hmm. so i said okay let's spend the money first few days difficult as it is so my 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 cousin he used to live in washington he was a doctor he was an intern so he promised me that okay initially i'll support you so i went there and and then so you landed uh, in new york and uh, then yeah, the, the, that's another big joke yeah yeah please. I, you know since i was flying the first time right. i said i would like to spend as much time in the plane as possible so i flew from bombay to karachi 
Karachi to Dharan, Dharan to Rome, and Rome to London, and then London to New York. Must have been like a 48-hour journey or yeah, something. Yeah, I was not, you know, three days of <laughs> three days you know, of not sleeping. <laughs> and then I uh, spent, and I, and I was sitting there. Back then, there was another thing. You can have a ticket of any airline and fly any other airline oh, at that time. Okay. You can go to Contour and they will accept it. Mm. So I did not know that but coming from Hyderabad, you know, I was completely alien to this thing. So I said, I went to the counter. He said, oh, you are going to Washington? Okay, I'll, I'll give you another. He gave me a Delta airline ticket. I had a Braniff airline ticket. So I was, uh, he said that, but you have to change the airport. You have to go to the LaGuardia. Mm-hmm. So he gave me a complimentary ticket, bus ticket. So I was sitting in the bus. I asked bus driver, are you going to Braniff airline? He said, no, sir, I'm going to Delta airline. He said, but I have, I have a ticket of Braniff. Yeah. Oh, you're on a wrong bus. So he, in the middle of the town, he just dropped me off. I don't know what to do. I was in the New York and only one sweater, freezing temperature. <laughs> but luckily, what happened was the same driver was coming back. Okay. He picked me up and he dropped me up at the uh, Kennedy Airport again. Yeah. So I went to the counter. I said that, no, I would like to fry this. I don't want to take any chances. Yeah. But I will be sitting right here. This was around six o'clock in the evening. Mm-hmm. And flight was at midnight. He said that I, I might be sleeping, so please wake me up in the plane. So he came and we. Uh, and another big joke, uh, you know, I I used to be drinking tea, uh-huh. so I was having terrible headache. So I went to the counter and I asked for a cup of tea. Yeah. So he gave me a, a styrofoam cup, mm-hmm. ten cents, and one tea bag, and he showed me that you know go to that. I didn't know that how to. Where I get- never saw tea bag in my life. So I was, uh, I went there and he started tearing that tea bag apart. So the one man was laughing at that time. He said, no, don't do it. Just take some hot water and dip in it. Yeah. I said, thank you. I sat down. Then uh, I, as, as I was sitting down and I was looking for sugar, there were sugar packets. packets. Yeah. I started dipping sugar <laughs> packet in the tea. <laughs> you, you know, it's interesting about this. My, ta- my takeaway as I listen to this is you remember the details. Yeah. And, I, and I'm guessing the reason is because this is a huge deal for you. Absolutely. Like you're doing something that's exciting and yeah. super adventurous, but very scary possibly. Yeah. It's a huge change. Yes. Your life is shifting completely. My dad, who is yeah. a good friend of yours, um, he he also remember these details, yeah. details that maybe you remember more clearly than what happened yesterday yeah. because of such a monumental shift and mon- monumental change. So how was it when you when you got here, your first experiences, were they scary? Was it more like shock at the culture? Yeah. What were some of the experiences? What let, some- let me first before I answer your question, your dad and I, my you know, very good friend, family friends, we are. And he... I landed admission. He was the only student who landed admission in Berkeley from Usmania University. And he bought a ticket from San Francisco. He bought a, a helicopter ride to Berkeley. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Omer, Omer mentioned something about a helicopter <laughs> right. ride on the, la- on the last that's episode. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you, right. you, so anyway, you know that so my, story. I go back to your question. Yes. The Indian government policy when I was growing up, Mm-hmm. not to bring a single thing from outside. Yeah. So everything was alien to me. I never saw a tea bag. I never saw a vending machine in my life because it was not there. That's right. So, you know, everything was alien. And you didn't have a phone. Like in, these days when we travel internationally, yeah. Yeah. we can just, if we're lost, we just call Uber. Yeah. Our worst case, we just make a phone call. And yeah. Yeah. You no, didn't no. have that. Back in those yeah. days, you need to either know someone who's going to pick yeah. you up from the airport yeah. Or you're on your own. Yes. Another thing when I, very difficult for me, mm. I was coming from an Urdu medium school. I wanted to talk about that. So the English was a big problem for me. We never spoke English in in, in Hyderabad. So, so I know in Hyderabad, like, do uh, you have Indian medium? I mean, sorry, Urdu medium schools. Yes. And then you have like schools like grammar school or St. Yes. Paul's. Yes. Like we were talking about our uncle, yes. Umar's dad. He went to grammar school. Yes. My father went to grammar school. Yes. Which were English medium. Yes. What were some of the... Like, I mean, with, with, besides the medium of the yeah. language, what were some of the differences between those two schooling systems? Yeah, one was British. Yeah. From a culture, you're asking from yeah. a cultural from point a of cultural view. Point to of give view. you an idea, this yeah. will bring you that, you know, the significance of value of the currency at that time. Please. We, three brothers, my, my older brother, myself, and my younger brother used to go to the same Urdu medium primary school. And our fee was two cents. 
Do pa sa. Do pa sa. Do pa sa. Eka na tin. Tino ka eka na. Tino ka eka na. Right, right. All three, one ana. One ana is like. Like one sixteenth. One sixteenth of a rupee. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Ana is no longer in currency. Yes. Yeah. And your your father, who went to grammar school, his fees was sixteen rupees. There is no way my father could have afforded that kind of a thing. That was the problem. So any anyway, we grew up somehow. And the only problem with that Urdu medium schools were so far behind mm. with these missionary schools right. that uh, we cannot compete with. You know, could not have competed with them. You know, you you mentioned missionary yeah. schools. That's a very. I mean, I would love to do. I mean, there's a whole history there which yeah. we don't have time to maybe necessarily discuss. But um, you know, for a lot of places, especially in India, but even other parts of the world. But if we're just focusing on India, you had these vestiges of these British schools that yes. were essentially missionary schools. Yes. That's why yours, like for example, grammar school that we often hear about as Hyderabadis, it's Saint George's grammar George, school. Yeah, yeah. Saint George's. Or my my uncle went to Saint Paul's. Saint Paul's. Even, and even on the even on the on the on the with the women, like my mom went to Saint Anne's. Yeah. That's right. right. You yeah. had Mahmoud, like yeah. Mahmoodia, which was the yeah Urdu medium, medium school, medium I think. School, and yes. then you had like Saint Anne's, exactly, yes. yeah. which were these sort of almost elite kind of uh, uh, you know missionary schools yeah. mm-hmm. and they were English medium English. but they were the vestiges of the British colonization yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so, very good and, and the, the thing uh, the, 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 they they had advantage over us mm-hmm. we as an Urdu medium student I had to learn Telugu which is the most difficult language to for Muslims to for comprehend that's and right. your father skipped that yeah because he went to missionary school yeah yeah These are you know, the fantastic relationship. No, and you're right. And in fact, they don't even teach Urdu or Arabic in school. No. So if you're going to learn Urdu or Arabic growing up, you have to learn it from like a Movi Saab Movi or go to an, like exactly. kind of our experiences. Exactly. Which is almost foreign to us because you would think, oh, you're in India. You know, yeah. you're going to just learn Urdu or no, you're not. Yeah. Because in school, you're not taught Urdu. You're not taught Telugu because you yeah. skip all of that if you go to the British uh, Avenue. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's a fascinating conversation. Yeah. So. You 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 come to America now. I mean, I I think I, I had a conversation with your son, you know, yes. Farhan, your older, your your eldest son. Yes. He mentioned that you, in fact, got into other schools, but yes. you chose Mississippi State, which I want to talk about. And, and going he, to school and, in Mississippi, because yeah, because uh, in the '60s, not, Brown and 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 you know. Uh, non-white people today to this day might avoid Mississippi. That's right for a variety right. of reasons. And no, my, no offense to any Muslims no, in Mississippi. No, no. And, and my father did his. You know, he was in Odessa, Texas, <laughs> do at the University of Texas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what was a brown person doing in the you know late sixties, yeah. early seventies? And I should so. say, no offense to any Mississippi, is not, not Muslim or not. Yeah, right? exactly. Same the thing prob- with Texans. Yeah, anyway, the problem, so. you know, I yeah. mean, of course, the money was the everything. We mm-hmm. had a very cheap. Uh, cost of living in mississippi right. and i went there there were two huge problem for me first of all when i flew from uh, washington i bought a ticket to go to atlanta atlanta to tupelo mississippi tupelo mississippi to uh, another another town there are three or four stops finally i went to columbus mississippi which was the town right. and it was i was the only passenger in the prop plane oh, and wow. this guy almost was ready to tell me that I'll just slow down. I do not don't, don't want to land it. You jump from the plane. <laughs> and anyway, so there was a one taxi driver at the time over there to take it to uh, Starkville, which is about 15 miles from the airport. He said, "My my my price is eight dollars." And remember, I only brought eight dollars from India. Wow. That's all they gave me the yeah. exchange. Yeah. Oh, no, no more. So I said, you know, I mean, and I, he was the only one. He said, yeah, otherwise you spend the night here at the airport. So I finally, okay, let's go to, and I went to Mississippi State. It was dark. There was nobody there on the, at the campus. He dropped me off. I was just standing there. What should I do with my suitcases? And luckily I found one of my classmates from uh, Spania University. He was walking by and there were at that time five or six people who came from the So he took me to his room in in dorm, and we spent night over there. And next morning, I went there and I enrolled myself in the in the uh, school. But the problem I had was not only I barely spoke English, English. southern accent killed me. Mm. I did not. I do not know what they were talking about. <laughs> wow, it was so horrible. That's right. And and the professor early on he told me that if you are planning to take a degree from this school, you better understand me. And more than me, I should understand you. 
So I said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck here. <laughs> so luckily, it, it was somehow. We, so how, how were? I mean, today yeah. we hear about you know, in the in the world of Trump, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you want to avoid. There's there's a bit of a label about Mississippi. Mississippi. How how was it there? How was it your it experience? It was so horrible. 1967, you must understand, 53 years ago, there were still uh, signs of slavery in mm-hmm. that state. Yeah. Segregation. There were signs. I went to a doctor's office. There is white entrance and there was black entrance. Mm. And I said, should, which door should I use? Yeah. You know, I was the problem like that. And did, 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 were, did anybody ever tell you one way or the other? No, I just stand there from somehow the nurse came in. I says, come this way. And she took me there inside. Uh, but the but the thing is this, even the top I mean, educated people, professors, my professors, they had such a like Trump mind mm-hmm. and they would talk nothing but the racism. Yeah. Directly and, to your face. No, directly to my face. Yeah. They, at that time, there was no problem for them. Wow, yeah. You know, just a few days before, if you recall, uh, John Kennedy, when he was still alive at that time, he sent troops to get a black student into Mississippi That's right. University, you know, to get, and the uh, the governor of the Mississippi was stopping that, you know, mm. that black man at the door. That's right. And the, the you know, all these agents, the, uh, they told him that by the order of the president of the United States, That's either right. you let us, let, let him in, otherwise we will have to force you. Fascinating. So wow. that's when he gave gave his insight. Yeah. So that were, were you actually ever scared about like, you know, there was a little, I'll, I'll tell you one example. We all, about, we, there were about 10 uh, Osmanians at that time. They came in with me. So we all rented a, an apartment in the downtown Starkville. Mm-hmm. Downtown means there was only one shop in there. There, there was <laughs> such a small place. Right. So there were 10 rooms and he charged like $25 per room. And then we shared rooms so to have a $12.50. There was a bunk bed. Mm. And then there was, uh, after one semester, there was another student came from Bangladesh. Mm. And he asked us, can, he, you know, so he can, can I join you? So I said, come on over. There is a room empty. Just He started living there. One day, this guy, Mr. Uh, his name was, uh, um, uh, I, f- I forgot his name. Mm-hmm. He came in, the owner, landlord. He said, who is this guy, the new guy in this? He said that he's also a student. He, he wants to pay the rent. He said, no, sir. When you all came in, every the whole community turned against me when I was renting you. Mm. So I told him, no, these are the foreign students and they are paying us the, you know, the fees. Yeah. So at that time, they were quiet. But this guy is so dark, mm. there is no way they will believe me that he's a foreign student. Oh, wow. wow. It's a fact of life. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. So they, there was an understanding... That they had that you're not African American. There's a they they kind of understood that these are foreigners, not African Americans. Yeah. Therefore, we'll give them something. something. We're not, we because won't be totally racist. The shade racist. of the colors are the so different. Wow. And yeah, they they still you know understand. Yeah. But there is one thing uh, in Mississippi. Southern people are very uh, prone to going to military. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of military people, mm-hmm. and at that time, Vietnam War is the peak. Yeah, that's true. And I used to watch every single day the bed, yeah. body bags coming. Oh, really? Every yeah. single day. That's right. And they were, you know, they were joining army and they were they were dying. Right. And uh, that was one thing good, you know, when southern people are kind of patriotic at That's that time, right. I guess. Yeah, still. And they were doing that. And in fact, when I was, uh, when I luckily in that year when I went there, the law was changed. The first time they were giving immigration to Asians. Before only Europeans were given, uh, Attorney General was uh, Robert Kennedy. He told the Congress that all we are getting because of our policy of Europe only, mm-hmm. whites only. That's right. We are getting barbers from Italy, <laughs> and we are we are losing out intelligent yeah. people. That's right. China and India, you know, the other countries will be benefiting this thing. So That's they right. changed the law. Yeah. I could apply directly for immigration. That's true. 1965 changed that. Yeah, yeah they changed it. Yeah. And then what happened was the moment I apply, they send me first before they send me to uh, the uh, to register myself uh, for uh, military. Military, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. for the draft. Draft. 
Without and, being a citizen, even if you're not a citizen. Even, you have, yeah. even as a green card holder, you must fight. That's wow. right. You, that's the condition that you will get okay. a visa. So I went there and registered myself. Luckily, I just turned 26 at the time. So my category was instead of 1A, was 2A. Wow. So th- there I got little reprieve that until they exhaust all the 1As. Mm. That's right. You know. In fact, there was a joke that uh, this guy who got 1A in his uh, draft thing, so at least I got A in something. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay, so you're in Mississippi. You spend, what, one or two years there? And uh, then you, where do you 18, 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. And just pr- probably just studying and focused on studying. And that's and then you and then you transferred or what yeah, happened? Yeah, no, actually, I keep on going because okay. I could not have afforded to transfer. And, okay. you know, there was no money to do. I uh, keep on working. We ignored all these problems because we were so busy with, uh, you know, School. our... our Perfecting our English and, mm-hmm. and listening to understanding professors and and day and night we are working very hard to to just pass the exams and yeah, Alhamdulillah we just managed to do it and after eighteen months I spent close to eighteen hundred and sixty dollars in eighteen months to get my master's degree mm-hmm. from Mississippi State. So you graduated. I graduated from there and then mm-hmm. I took a Greyhound bus from Mississippi. Promising myself never to be in the 500 mile radius, you know, from this area. <laughs> wow. And I, I, so it was a bit of a traumatic experience. It overall. was very, 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 very horrible experience. Mm. Yes. So we, I came back to Washington to my brother and then, and and then I had already landed a job while I was in a school. Okay. In Pennsylvania. So you had an old, one of your brothers was living in Washington. Washington, yes. Okay. My cousin. And then I... C- cousin, uh, not... not no, you were cousin. the first of your family. Yeah, I was the first. Did any of your other siblings immigrate during that time? No, they nobody come. was there. Yeah, okay. everybody was in Hyderabad. Mm-hmm. Then I uh, came to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where I started my job. This is 1969. Steel? Uh, no, and not still, still. I was engineer. I was in Pennsylvania Department for Transportation. Okay. Because the the advantage of working for the department, they considered that as an essential service for the fight against Vietnam. So they gave me a deferment. Oh, yeah, that was important. Very right important. Then. Very Another, important. Factor. Completely foreign to us, the yeah. idea of a, of getting a deferment, which yeah. meant that you wouldn't get drafted. Drafted, yes. Even if they got to the 2A category. Yes. You would, you, you, would you, not get you got that. the, edu- not, what is it called? Essential. Essential services. Services needed. deferment. The deferment, yeah. 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 Because highways are important for bridge, maintenance bridges for transportation of army vehicles. That's right. Things like that. So you said Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. Transportation, yeah. Okay. I worked there in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. There were many, many districts there. Uh, I chose to stay in Pittsburgh. And so, anecdotally, I think that's where my parents and, and you... We met and again, met, right? Oh, we met again, okay. yes. That's right. Okay, fascinating. And, and then at, at that time, I mean, I imagine in Mississippi, besides you and your fellow foreign students, there were no Muslims. But how about Pittsburgh in the late... Pittsburgh was... you know. The, let me give you this thing. When I went to Pittsburgh, there was... Uh, my cousin's friend used to live in Pittsburgh. He was a doctor. So he came and picked me up and uh, at the Greyhound station. He took me to his house. Then I said, drop me off at the in the downtown YMCA. So I wanted to, you know, rent the place there. In YMCA was a place where all these, you know, druggies and all kind of problem people mm-hmm. hang around, mm-hmm. hang around. There was a sign over there on the on the wall. I still remember that thing. The fastest way to double your money is to fold it and keep it in your pocket. <laughs> So that I remember that thing. I still following that. I did not increase in my wealth also, but uh, there was absolutely. I mean, the Muslims were so scattered in Pittsburgh. You know, at least half an half a, half an hour drive okay. from where I was living okay. to next Muslim family. Mm. There was no masjid for from sixty nine to seventy nine. I worked there ten years in in, in the department. I did not attend any Juma because there is no Juma. There is no nothing. I mean, you know, no masjid. Mm. Then we started meeting in the University of Pittsburgh and gathering few Muslims on Sunday as starting a Sunday school. And you've, by yeah. this time you've been married, you're, you had a few, you know, Farhan yeah. probably was born. So you went back home and got married? Yeah, in, in I, what happened was I worked for three years. Okay. In 1971, December the 3rd, which was the <laughs> starting of Bangladesh for the same night. 
Uh, yeah, I, 71 war. 71 war. The day yeah. the from marriage. Yeah. yeah, wow. <laughs> so he went to, uh, my. I, I wrote to my mom that, you know, I'm coming. I saved enough money to travel to India and a little bit more for my marriage. Nice. And I'm coming home because I was mm-hmm. already 28 years old by then. Mm-hmm. So she, I said, pick pick one you know, girl of your choice. You know, you me, you know my yeah. my preference. When I went there, the the girl they picked me, it was not that okay. was changed already. Yeah. So at the airport, they introduced me this tall man. He looked like a Lyndon Johnson. By the way, in uh, in <laughs> last 53 years, I have seen 10 presidents. Wow. So he was the president when I when I went to Pittsburgh. Uh, so, you know, I never saw my wife before my marriage. Right. My wife did not see me before our marriage. After the Jalwa and after Nikah, everything, they say, here is your wife. <laughs> and well, when we talk about uh, the current situation, you know, as we get later on in the show, maybe I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, on that topic, uh, yeah, how, how yeah. kids are getting married and if you have any advice. But we'll, maybe we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. But yeah, I mean, though, your experience is not unlike the experience of so many of yeah, our parents' yeah, generation. Yeah. Um, and so then um, you, you come right back with your wife? Your wife yeah, what yeah. happened was, this is another thing, yeah. you know, you know how it is to, when you are married, then you have to apply for and wait for the visa. That's right. But back then, you know, 71, I went there to Madras to get her visa. Mm-hmm. I took her with me. And I went inside the embassy uh, and I talked to the uh, Cons- consulate office officer and I just we were just talking chatting about baseball game and things like that he was from he was a very young man from New York he was very interestingly listening to my conversation you know, coming back yeah. then I told him that is it possible for her to get immigration today I'm applying and I today he looked at me like this as if I'm coming from a different planet right he said okay what you should do is first of all she did not even have passport wow and and all the uh, med- medical exams to go through for immigration right so he luckily this guy says you go and get your passport today from the passport office and go to this doctor and get your x-rays and everything done by 5 o'clock you come through the back door wow through the back door you know in, in Hyderabad, in, in Hyderabadi language, there's yeah. beautiful poetry. Uh-huh. And there is a poet who write Anglo-Urdu poetry. Oh, okay. What his and, name? Uh, Mustafa Ali Beg. Okay. He said that, O be wafa te raah ki turning me reh gaye. Ham to akele life ki burning me reh gaye. Ya kaam nikla karte hain so back door se. Ya kaam nikla karte hain so back door se. Diwane main door ki watching me reh gaye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to translate that. Wow. Diwan and door ki watching me rehga. That's right. So what, that was, the, you know, and he was very kind yeah. and he opened Basically, the, the gist of it being that everything, yeah. you know, gets done through the back door, um, you know, like through, through yeah. these sort of unsavory means. Yes. Um, and then the, the, it's the crazy person that ends up trying to do it about yeah. the official, yeah, the official means. Way. Official way. For through, six months. That's right. I never, I never get it. <laughs> so you were ambitious enough to, 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 to and, and then you made a connection with this. Connection. I mean, no, no, this guy gave me the yeah. same day yeah. immigration unheard visa. of and you know and he told me that this he gave me the packet take this only open at is the new york airport so my wife and we came together uh, that was another dilemma at that time that i was not ready for buying her ticket uh, right, so anyway right. some managed to you know come. something you did mention which again i think is so anecdotal of of so many of that generation you mentioned Having you saved enough money to go buy yeah. your airfare back to India yeah. to get married yes. and have enough money to, um, you get know, married. to get married. Yes. Uh, there was something about that early generation about saving money, like yeah. savings, frugality, yeah. living not only within your means, yes. but saving as much as possible. Yeah. And and that's, like I said, anecdotal, not just to you, but so yeah. many of that generation. Yeah. And I feel like, again, that's kind of like something that we lack yeah. in our generation because we take so much of it to, for granted. Yeah. But living kind of not only within your means, but really like contemplating savings and um, w- why save at that time? Like, Let was me it, tell you, give yeah. me an example. My yeah. father passed away and my mother was living very, very difficult time. Right. And I told her that until I am ready and I start earning, please be patient. And she was very, very patient, right. you know, very difficult time for her. 
and we have, I have three ma- sisters unmarried waiting right. for their marriages. That's right. And that all my responsibility at that time. So, you know, you have to feel the responsibility. Yeah. My father keep ta- taught us one lesson constantly that learn to be responsible. Mm. Learn to be responsible. You know, I did not know until that point that, you know, so I realized that I have to save. You can imagine right now you can call to India on WhatsApp for free. <laughs> yeah. That's It's, right. you know, It's completely then, different. Yeah. Back then you have to book your long distance call. That's right. $15 a minute. Oh my God. Which is insane. Insane. And yeah. not everyone in India has a phone. Yeah. So I mean, sometimes... You have to go to somebody else's somebody, phone. And so you end up sometimes having to wait 10 yeah, minutes yeah, for yeah. that person to come from the other house. Yeah. Two, two o'clock mm-hmm. in the morning, she will wake me up, the operator. Now your call is ready. And a very disturbed call you will get. And you, if you go more than three or four minutes, you know, it's like... Yeah. Your pocket is empty. Yeah. You know, sometimes I hear people talking about... Our, like our generation talking about our parents, our parents yeah. should have done uh-huh. this or that better. Yeah. Maybe point guided us more uh-huh. or given us this or not, but just general yeah. Yeah. complaints or what, sure. what have you. But then you have to pause and, and appreciate yes. just the, the major uplift they had to do the shift from their normal life yeah. to this with yeah. no phone, no yeah. communication can cut off from their Absolutely. families. It's, it's, I, I used to use the analogy of like, hey, imagine if we had to move to China yes. and our kids were Chinese yes. and we had to, but it's even more than that because we didn't, we would have cell phones and phones, you know, WhatsApp yeah. and, and credit cards, yeah. but you didn't even have that. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. And, and I remember like, again, growing up and my earliest memories of my mom and my father communicating with their parents mm-hmm. back home because none of my grandparents immigrated to America. Um, And so, you know, it was like you mentioned this idea of having to wait for the operator to connect you and you would wait by the phone, but also, you know, outside, besides communicating by phone, you would send like arrow, like, um, uh, Letter. letters yeah, and, yeah. and, and A- airmail, yeah. air yeah. air yeah. that's yeah. right. Which is very different concept than even yeah. like post, like, you know, anyway, there's yeah. a whole, and the, and the way the letter would open up and you would uh. d- wrote directly <laughs> On the thing Every that was mailed. Every single Bar- inch will be yeah. used up. Every single <laughs> inch. Yeah. That is so true. Bar- Barbez, you wrote a couple of those to us when you were living in Bombay. But uh, let's yeah. maybe let's fast forward a bit sure, to, sure, sure. and yeah. talk about now the 1980s and yeah. really the the Muslim identity forming. Yeah, Because right. I, I, what I heard from my parents is that that generation, when they came here, it was, it was just, they were Muslims by Heather Badi culture. Yes. Yeah. But it wasn't, they didn't have the awakening. Absolutely. So maybe you can talk about yeah, to- what happened in the 1980s and yeah. when did that awakening start and the formation of community yeah. and masjids and organizations and, and real quick i want to mention also you so you you, you mashallah have three uh, three children yes. uh two boys and then a girl in the middle um they, they were by the 80s if we fast forward to the yeah. 80s mm-hmm. were all of your children already born um yeah, yeah. Uh, no 80 was the last one yeah. farman was born farman was 80 okay yeah. okay yeah so yeah. got it um, so, and you're living in the 80s yeah. Where? before in Saudi Arabia right yeah no first i came and worked in pittsburgh for 10 years right. okay. 79 you then said then i become so stagnant i moved to i i changed my job to us army corps of engineers and i worked in uh, ohio okay. uh, akron area for about three years and that's when i was actually keying on working with core you know, overseas job So they called me in for Saudi Arabia job. And I worked there for five years with them. That's where my children, first time in their life, they saw a masjid. They heard the adhan. Yeah. And they went to Mecca and other other places. Mm-hmm. Which city were you living in? in Saudi Arabia? Uh, there was a place called Al-Batin, which is near uh, Kuwait border. That's where they were building a, in, a military city okay. of 70,000 people uh, to attack Iraq. Oh. Back then, even when I went there, they were... Iraq was fighting with Iran. That's right. And they were supporting Iraq. They were. But they were preparing for attacking on Iraq back then. Well, so anyway, we... Uh, you were still with the U.S. Corps, Corps of Engineers. Uh, engineers. Yeah, we used to work for them. Yeah. They, we built their city. But this acts as, as kind of an acceleration of the Muslim identity. Right? Identity, Being in the, right? yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when we came, 1970, remember the date, 1979 was the year with America, massages start popping up. First time. For 10 years, I did not have a Juma, any masjid. But in 1979, they established going to the university and other places to establish Juma. What prayer. do you think was the spark for that? People, you know, we, we, we brought some culture with us. Yeah. When we, missing a Juma prayer, it was a horrible thing for us. Especially in Ramadan. Yeah. 
we don't know when many times i fasted 32 days because when when we do, i did not know when the ramadan started when it finished finished so you know in fact i develop a computer program to have my time table for ramadan using computer you know, ibm 360 with the punch cards <laughs> so i i develop and in, alhamdulillah i was using that thing but 1979 uh, msa was you know like already uh, established it was yeah. changed to isna yes and they were helping other local communities you know sending them calendars selling them you know when the ramadan started and then uh, in fact nate was formed uh, north america islamic Isn't trust, trust. Yeah. giving them loans for masjid buying mm-hmm. and alhamdulillah we established uh, when i was in pittsburgh we had we had a meeting i remember that local muslims got together mm-hmm. what will it take to build a masjid in pittsburgh mm-hmm. and back then in 1973 74 time frame we were talking about 500000 dollars you know how, how much i was earning in the in, in, with fund dot 9000 dollars a year wow so 500 500000 and... is just you know i mean you might as well say uh, in the millions million. yeah, 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 yeah. 50 million by yeah. today's yeah. standards yeah, yeah so true. anyway we uh, we we started <clears throat> praying in the in the university campuses getting their rooms and establish juma and then slowly renting some churches and some homes right. for to establish masajid and alhamdulillah slowly but surely the masajid started coming up by mid 70 uh, by mid 80s 80s right lot of masajid you know now alhamdulillah there was only one masjid in bay area by the way when i came here so did you come here after uh, saudi arabia after saudi arabia i came directly here okay and so yeah. you landed here in the bay area when in the bay area bay area 1987 okay so maybe using the bay area as kind of an anchor <laughs> yes. um to talk about the or, or to respond to the question that omar talked about which yes. is kind of what what is happening in the muslim community in the in the what mid 80s yeah, now in the bay area yeah What was the one masjid that you said was uh, already There was a Crescent uh, Avenue masjid in in San Francisco and the, they were, they had Juma prayer established in community centers like Sunnyvale okay. the first MC, uh, MCA was formed in in Sunnyvale that's when in 1975 Maulana Abul Hasan Ali Nadwi rahmatullah alayhi came to Beria He came to the Bay Area Beria and there was no masjid So he looked around and he said, "Can you call few Muslims and we? I not. I need to talk to them." So for the listeners, sorry, Abu Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi is one of the greatest scholars that the subcontinent has produced. Absolutely, uh, Rahimullah. Um, uh, it comes from the Nadwa, like Nadwatul Ulama school of, um, of of Islamic training. But anyway, uh, I never knew who he came to he the Bay Area. He came here and he called in few people, and he said, "What I am looking around, there is no masjid, no future for your children to remain Muslims." he said that if you cannot protect your islam in this country my advice to you is to go back go back home die of hunger but protect islam mm. alhamdulillah you know we that touched us most of us and we worked very hard and alhamdulillah the you said 1975 you were, you were here oh, no no you, you, you heard of this story i heard from this right, he right. wrote a book actually on morana abul hasan his visit to america he wrote a book I don't know if it's been translated no, into it's, English. Uh, Must in be Urdu notable. The title was "Maghrib se kuch saaf saaf baatein." Acha. He wrote that book. Uh, Maybe it's translated. Clear either. and concise conversations with the West would yeah, be a right. translation. Sorry. Right. Sorry. And yeah. and then he uh, he keep keep on asking our status how it is going even after going back there. Mashallah. So Alhamdulillah, the first purchase they bought Masjid Al Noor, and they bought SBIA building. Salam Khureshi. Allah uh, keep him uh, with us. He bought it for us. I mean, he was a very rich man at that time. He had a computer company. The downtown. Yeah, downtown uh, San San Jose. San Jose Mosque, yeah, which is still there on Third Street. Yeah, still there today. And then you said Masjid Noor, of course, which was the predecessor to MCA. MCA. Ka- Catherine Street. Yeah, Catherine Street. Yes. <laughs> Catherine Street. That's And right. And then after that, immediately the day Masjid was open, that's the day I came to Bay Area. Wow. So you know, and it's immediately it became. It was the first Ramadan. It was too small for for the community. We were praying in the rain in the parking lot and outside. And finally, my Ukhah Marhum, may Allah make his grave one of Jannah. Amen. Uh, he very vigorously started looking and gathering community around, and he 
finally purchase this MCA building. Brother Marwub Khan was, uh, no, Mahbub Khan. Mahbub Khan, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking Marwub Quraysh, yeah. I was uh, confusing too. Um, and Brother Mahbub Khan was at MCA? MCA, yeah. Okay, okay. He was MCA. Yeah. And you know, what he did was, uh, uh, the, the, this building, MCA, this building was belonged to Hewlett Packard. Uh, was a training center, which MCA. So when we went there, it was listed for $7 million. And we had only $10,000 in our bank account. Mm. So when we best first made an offer, they refused because you are not a serious buyer because you don't have money to even back it up. So finally, the Salam Qureshi collateral his company to start the negotiation. Wow. And we started negotiation and he, he gathered how many Muslims working for Europe Packard. And he wrote a petition to David Packard that we are Muslims, we need a you know, Muslim masjid here. Wow. It's good for your own company when we are, you know. So he wrote on the same letter to his uh, real estate guy that negotiate solely with Muslims, you know, on this property. Wow. And then they started negotiating and then they brought down to $3.6 million. Not only that, he said that give us, give us in three different installments, three years. Amazing. In retrospect, that was an amazing deal, right? <laughs> Absolutely amazing deal. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine yeah. that that property is, you know, the acreage yeah. Yeah. in the heart of Silicon Valley. Yeah. And 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 just to, you know, my my two cents is now in the Bay Area, there's so many masjids. Yes. MCA is just one of them. One of them. But even in the early 2000s, yes. the MCA was the pillar yes. in the Bay Area. That's, That's where you went for everything. 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 And I remember actually... Um, in the maybe 93, 94, yes. I used to come visit because my sister was yes. here and you took us to MCA because you said there's yeah. this new imam you have to hear. That yeah. was Hamza Yusuf. Yusuf. And yeah. I remember uh, I remember that and I remember it was in the process of being converted because there was cubicles in yeah, certain yes. areas for yes, Hewlett yes. Packard. Yes. And I also remember the fried chicken, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, mashallah, like, I mean, to, to, to give you an idea, uncle, like we've had so many guests on the show. Yes. Um, you know, whose stories go back to MCA. Yes. So many people who took their shahada at MCA. Allahu Akbar. So many people, like you said, you mentioned Mahbub Khan. Yes. Uh, you know, Sheikh Hamza tells the story about speaking at ISNA, being invited yeah. to speak at ISNA. And had it not been Mahbub uh, Khan who kind of pushed him to take the offer, to speak at ISNA, yeah. he would have never accepted the offer. And, and who knows where that trajectory would have gone with Sheikh Hamza. Yeah. So, I mean, so much happened um, with that early pioneering community in in, in, in MCA. Yeah. Um, certainly people of our generation yeah. who now, you know. even But this is not even, I'm not talking about just the 80s and 90s, even yeah. the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's what I mean. Of, a lot of the new masjids are really just 10, past 10, 15 years. That's yes. right. That's yes. right. MCA was the community the place the in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, certainly. Yeah. My young brother has a very good uh, comment about MCA. So that MCA is a Costco of Masajid. <laughs> so you, it has everything in it. <laughs> very true. Very so true. I served, I'm fortunate enough to serve on the board uh, five years. I mean, think so about how many that. organizations can even trace their roots back to MCA, yeah. ING, Zaytuna, all of these, yeah. you know, Care. A A Amela, Care, yes. all these organizations that are now. Unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as a bachelor, I spent a ton of time there. If I wasn't spending time there, you know, you'd yeah. be somewhere else, right? Yeah. That's it right. Keeps keeps people connected to the community. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. One thing uh, for your listeners, yes. this is very important. That uh, Mahbukha Marumi was a very good friend of mine. Mm. And he said to me one time that if you are on the right path, on, on the path of haq, and if uh, you are with Allah, even if you are alone, you are in majority. Mm. Because, you know, miracles happen in MCA. Mm -hmm. If I started telling the story of MCA, hours will go by. Mm. You know, when the LSI logic sued us, and it's just unbelievable. Sheikh, uh, Sheikh uh, Mahbub Khan Maroom took Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to LSI Logic guy who was, you know, who was fighting with us. And he said, why well, you are fighting? We would like to be a good neighbor. We are complying with all the requirements. And he was, he was, he looked at them and said, I must congratulate you. You are on the five yard line, but I will not let you do the touchdown. So at the time, <sighs> Hamza Yusuf stood up. He said that he's, this guy is not going to listen to us. Yeah. He said that. Mark my word, those who oppose to oppose the haq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped them out within six months. That company bankrupted in six months. And you know, the thing is this, uh, that that suing logic was a blessing of Allah. 
that allowed us time mm-hmm. to do all the you know all the upgrades we didn't have money for but two three years we collected money and we did the upgrading because of that lawsuit right yeah and just to, just to, for clarification yeah. lsi logic was across the street and across. didn't want a masjid near Not them right near them, that, because okay. their main objective was the granada right. school there were children there oh. were about 400 children going right. to school right. and they they have some hazardous waste they produce and if some accident happen the kids are there so we put alarms on the all around the masjid hmm. for any accident or anything right for safety against it but it's still they keep on fighting it but now you know everything is history Mm. So we Everything have. Uh, right. uh, so, what were some of the other challenges that you just maybe want to call out? One or two stories right. that you faced in the '80s and '90s, and maybe even the 2000s, similar similar to the this first, that that you overcame. The first challenge I faced when I went to Pittsburgh is, Parhan was born in 1975, and not having any Muslim community with us is a big disadvantage. Yeah, no masjid, big disadvantage. So I said, how can I protect his his being identity as a Muslim? So I produced in the house itself everything that is, you know, that he learning experience for him as an on Islam. You know, we showed him how to how a Muslim day, day and night. And you know, with three children, we we did the same thing. But after going to Saudi Arabia and coming back, the community already established, and they had all these things. Back then, there was no Islamic school. And you were uh, you were in uh, briefly in in Saudi Arabia, yeah, right? Yeah, eighty to eighty four. The most difficult time part in Saudi Arabia is to find a Quran teacher in yeah. Saudi Arabia. Surprise! Find a Malvi Sab. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. No, mashallah, you did something right because I mean I, I know all of your children, uh, you know, and and they're amazing, and not only professionally, but I remember the first time I actually little story. You 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 definitely don't know this, uncle, but the first time I ever met Farhan. Um, was uh, he was attending a language institute, um, a, a, a Arabic language uh-huh. uh, intensive in uh-huh. Michigan, uh-huh. and I was this was the Alim program uh-huh. and also the Al Lisan program, which was the Arabic component of it. Uh-huh. And uh, Farhan uh, and, and also a young man named Dave Coolidge, who mm. I don't know if you know David, but Dave is. Um, you know, uh, uh, now lives in the Bay Area, but anyway, um, they they were roommates actually of, of of that program. But that's the first time I met Farhan, mm. and then of course, then came the family connections that I had because I grew up with Romana and to your sister's yeah. Yeah. Uh, children, uh, Shahida, Zahida, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to Nazima. I can name all of them. Mashallah, is a big family, mm-hmm. um, but wonderful children that I grew up with. But um, yeah, it's the first time I met Farhan, and it, that was after Farhan had already done. I think a few months in Jordan mm-hmm. or somewhere studying yeah, Arabic. Yeah, he did that for Arabic. In yeah, Jordan, yes. after doing and and Farhan, I mean, just to you know, might as well. Yeah, I think Berkeley undergrad, uh, U Penn, uh, you know, <laughs> graduate school. So you know, mashallah, like I said, professionally and uh, uh, you know, spiritually, and and the same can be said about Fariha and Farman. So yes, mashallah. And 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 let's let's start talking about maybe yeah. ad, advice but in the context children. of all these topics, yeah. right? Yeah. So. It's as a parent, I'm, I'm, I have a 12 year old and a seven year old, uh, two girls. Uh, and now I'm really starting to think about some of these things about their Muslim identity. Um, and the world has gotten more complex. It's harder to be in some ways, many ways, maybe it's harder to be Muslim. Um, and it's easier to be materialistic and so forth. So what advice would you have to give uh, and based on your experiences? I mean, clearly, like I said, you did raise three uh Great kids. I mean, they're friends of mine as well. Yeah. Um. We a lot of us look to Farhan well, for professional and 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 um, uh, community ex- advice. Yeah. You know. So and, and I I think to to kind of um you know build on what Omar just asked. You know, he, he like Omar, you mentioned materialism and like you know kind of falling trapped to the mm-hmm. materialistic trappings of life. One of the things that at least just knowing personally your family, like your mm-hmm. children, and as I mentioned, Romana Auntie's children. Mm-hmm. In addition to kind of the religious rearing, I think one of the things that is indel like you can't if you meet Farhan or any any of your family members for a long period of time is this very strong work ethic. Yes. Also, yes. The ability to work hard yes. and persevere. And I know, like I said, growing up with Ramana and these mm. kids, same story there. Yes. They both accomplished amazing. I mean, all of the children are amazing in their professional lives. Yes. 
but hardworking. Yes, I, mean, I have to I, echo that for sure. Yeah, I remember like working at a grocery store with like Shahida and Zayda, you know, I mean, it's just like, the, and all the children were like that. And mashallah, I remember the, in the Houston community, they were kind of known as this really, really hardworking yes. family. And now mashallah, they're all physicians and doctors and, you know, professionals. So talk a little bit about that as well, yeah, like what, kind of you know, instilling me, those values. You know, as Omar pointed out that the experience brought my advice. Uh, these days, one of the biggest challenge which we have as a community, Muslim community in America, the uh, Pew study just released that we are losing as many Muslims as we are gaining exactly right. the same number. Yeah. So young people, young Muslims, mm -hmm. this is a very big tragedy. Yeah. You know, when... Uh, Islam is not just a religion that you follow. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. You know, it teaches us work ethics. It teaches us uh, all the manners and how you treat, how you talk to people, how you uh, make halal living, mm -hmm. things like that. So it's, it's like every day, step by step guide through us. And when, you know, these kids have got, parents work hard, they make a lot of money. Now these kids have become rotten. Uh, you know, they... they <laughs> <laughs> they, they need nothing but Porsche and all these uh, Rolex watches and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, we have to understand that we have to teach them manners and what work at this. You know, when this ayah was, uh, came in the Quran, that, ya oh, people who believe, protect yourself and your family from hellfire. Right. Ibn Abbas, who was the Mufassir al-Quran, he said that it means that teach them manners. Mm teach them manners, adab. adab yeah. So, you know, we are not doing that. I know, unless, where else can they go, these kids? You know, schools are not teaching them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, outside your friends are not teaching them. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate. You know, in Farsi, there is a saying that, is adad whatever I got is not my efforts, it's Allah's one of Allah's blessing. Beautiful. When Farhan and Faria went to Berkeley, that changed their life. Mm -hmm. That's where they met the group of Muslims. Yeah. And they bond they bonded and they learned Islam in a real sense. Right. He learned Tajweed, which I could not teach him at home. I myself is not good in Tajweed. Mm. So these are the things that you have to pray constantly for their safety and for their protection of mm. uh, you know Iman. Uh, that's the one thing I must tell and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can only guide mm -hmm. through. But mm -hmm. also do your share. You know, if you are doing, if you are leading a life of, uh, you know, away from Islam, mm -hmm. don't expect your children to, you know, be a good Muslim. You have, you definitely have to raise your own game. I, I said something to a friend the other day and he said that resonated, so I'll share it, which is um, parenthood brings to light yes. the gap between your ideal, what you yeah. want and your reality. And then yeah. it's up to you how hard you're going to work well, to bridge that gap. Yes. If you really want to be a role, a role model and a teacher for your yes. kids, you actually have to raise your own game yes. so it's more closer to your ideals. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing is this, like Sayyidina Ali used to say that, do not expect to raise your children like you are raised when you are a child. Mm. Times are different. Mm. You have to understand their situation. They are under constant pressure. They are, you know, with this all these toys they have, you know, cell phone, iPhone, you know, all these games and everything. Uh, you have to understand that Be use your judgment and with extreme love and affection, guide them through. Mm. You know, it cannot be like our forefathers, you know, they did a different method, you know, beating up and things like that. It's not going to work here. It's not going to work. So we need to be very cognizant of this fact and try to be very patient. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah. and, uh, and, 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 and do your part, you know. The thing is this, more than anything else, at the end of the day, the accomplishment you see because of your hard work is so satisfying, so, you know, rewarding. That's right. That uh, words just cannot describe this. So thing. true. So beautiful. So yeah. true. You know, when I see my children growing up, you know, when they are, uh, Farhan was eight years old when we were coming back from Saudi Arabia. And he was in, we spent in New York with my brother. And my brother was not very careful about his salah and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So he came to me. It was after midnight, Faran. And he, I was talking to my brother and he said, Dad, can I do it again? I did not hear what he was saying. Just go, go, do, do it. Yeah. My brother was listening. He said, did you hear what he's saying? I said, no, he wanted to do something. I said, what? <laughs> no, did you hear what he's saying? I said, what is he saying? 
He said that in the travel, I missed three prayers. I would like to pray first before I eat dinner. Otherwise, I'll go to sleep. Mm. Can I do that? He started, my brother started praying because of that. Mm. Then I told this story to my friend in, at work. He started praying in the office. He went to Pakistan. He told his brother this story. His brother said, go and kiss that boy. He changed my life. Mm. These are the things. Mm -hmm. This is rewards. That's right. You know, unbelievable. That's right. And so the reward that you feel, yes. I mean, you can't help but feel that, mashallah, yeah. when you see that your children, yeah. you know, are are like, yeah, like you like, like you mentioned, that's a, that's, a, that's a kind of a beautiful incentive. We don't yeah. often think about that. Yeah, it's, like I definitely appreciate the reminder to lead with like gentleness and love yeah. and an example and not, not the way our, not necessarily just what you saw done 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Or kind that. of the dogmatic uh, yeah. kind of approach. Yeah. What, and what about, what, what, what advice would you give us as those who are, yes, we're trying to balance our family, but we're also trying to give back to the community. But there is this tug yeah. in terms of our fam our family time and yes. our careers. Yes. How do you, what, what advice would you have um, to us as individuals? And then, and then kind of related to that, where do you hope the community, where do you yes. hope to see the community go to yeah. kind of take it there? Yeah. Uh, our, our presence in America to the next level? Yeah. That's a bigger question. Omar, it's but. a very, very important question. Time is something which is priceless. And we have to manage our time, learn to manage our time. Mm. And, you know, we understand our responsibility. We have to do all those things. As Muslims, you know, the other people, they don't have all these uh, responsibilities like we do. And we have to, whatever little we can do, you have to pay the attention to your family. They need your time, quality time. Mm -hmm. Also, you need, your community needs your talents and your, you know, work. Whatever time you can, you know, squeeze in at the expense of sometimes your own sleep time, you do it. And, uh, there is one thing I would like to, uh, you know, assure all my audience and yourself mm -hmm. that uh, when you work in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah makes your job easier for you you know, your own problems will go away. He sent angels to take care of your problems. Mm -hmm. You know, so understand this thing that there are rewards for this. That's right. The I concept think of, of Baraka, right? Yeah, Baraka. Tremendous Baraka in time. That's right. You know, how much, like, take, take the example of our role model, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His time. I mean, he used to divide up his nights, three portions. One third of his time was uh, in, in prayers. One third with his wife. Mm -hmm and one third for sleeping. Yeah. And when somebody comes at night asking some question, what would he do? He take time from his sleep, not from the wife's time, not from the ibadah time. Mm. Mm. No, that's beautiful. And, and like you said, like the barakah of time, I mean, how much was, like if you study the life of the Prophet, I mean, even post Nabuwa, yeah. it's just 23 years. Yes. But imagine what was accomplished in Amaz 23 years. Amaz is blessed. And another thing I, I thought of when you mentioned about you know, just whatever time, you know, when, when, when you work or when yeah. you work, when you're active in the community for the sake of God, God opens up other opportunities yes. for you. You know, like there's a verse of the Quran, yes. uh, fina yeah. li yeah. like, yeah. like those who strive in yeah. Allah's path, God opens up, you know, the ways, the, the ways yeah. of Absolute. God. Exactly. Absolutely. I believe in it. Yeah, I yeah, believe that's in right. it. And also one of the things which I mentioned in that letter, which you read, that my entire rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for one quality I always in, you know, cherish. Please. And this is, thank you. Thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every little gift he gave me. Every, every little thing I thanked him promptly. Mm -hmm. And the thanking, there are, there are three ways you can thank. By, you know, by saying thank you Allah, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. By praying to Raka and uh, you know, fasting or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or by giving charity. Mm -hmm. This is the best way to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving in charity. Yeah. And you know, yeah. and, and this is a promise of Allah that you thank me, I will give you more. That's right. Yeah. If you're grateful to me, yeah, I, I'll I will give, give you more. more. Yeah. So right. we, we talked a little about parenting and you gave us some good advice there and about also about time management, yes. about being thankful. Where do you hope, where do you hope to see from our next generation? What do you want? Like both our, you, you know, my generation, your kids' yeah. generation, but then also the next generation. I mean, what do you, hope? you have six grandchildren? 
Uh, I have six now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, maybe, so, and, and maybe that's a good place yeah, to kind of yeah. start wrapping up. Right, is, right. Like, is, so where do you, what would you like to see for your grandchildren? Yeah, I mean, yeah. now that you've mushed both in terms of in, as individuals, but as, as a community, and as communities too, mm-hmm. both that they become a part of. Yeah, you know, we have done our share. You know, we have uh, taught them our children uh, whatever needs to be taught, uh, and uh, I hope that they will do the same thing for their children. And I have, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful that you Allah gave you opportunity. There are resources in this country which is not available in other countries. For even a sip of water, they have to struggle in other countries. That's right. But here you are in a, you're at disposal, so many things at your disposal. And the best of the thing this Allah gave you a fantastic mind. So use that and as much as you try and constantly praying for you know for their safety. One of the prayer in my my typical prayer is that oh Allah protect my progeny until Yom Al Qiyama, mm. keep them on Islam, mm-hmm. because you know that will be a if 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 you come to this country and a third or fourth generation lost, it's a disaster for my immigration or for my you know. That's, that's right. why the uh, mm. Malana Abu Nasr said that. That's right. If you cannot protect it, go back. Otherwise, die of hunger, mm. but protect your. Your way of life. Yeah, and 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 you know, it's it's a kind of expected that language, yes, and culture, yes, will because they're Americans, yes. right? But religion, um, religion you can hold on to, even though typically in previous immigrant, yes, uh, usually it's the language, then it's the culture, then it's the religion that goes. Yeah, that goes. But yeah. I think we're we're doing our best to try to, try to maintain it. it. But uh, yeah. any yeah. thoughts on that, just yeah. in terms of the culture versus the religion? Yeah. In a culture, there is a constant attack. Even if you, the moment you step outside your door, there is an attack on your culture mm-hmm. every which way. Mm-hmm. You have to adhere to that that culture, even if you hold it with your fingernails, mm-hmm. you know, and give the importance to this. Unfortunately, language, even I am responsible to some degree that I did not teach my children Urdu. Uh, it has a lot of big role. You know, like his father went to in missionary school. Mm-hmm. I went to Urdu. There is a day and night difference, my culture and his father's culture. Mm-hmm. And we were from the same city. That's right. No, I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Unless, you know, you unless you cannot express yourself in that language. Mm. For example, there is a word haya. That's right. Which is a part of deen. That's right. You cannot translate in English. So what, you're, what I'm hearing for you is don't necessarily throw away yeah. language. Even though lang- you know, people talk about keep the religion, don't worry so much about yeah. the culture. I'm kind of hearing something different from you, which is don't don't um don't devalue those things because they Absolutely. they help contribute to your yeah. overall being right? Absolutely. for fourteen hundred years. That's yeah. right. The keep the you know it's keep on generation after generation to us. Now we have become the weakest link in this chain. That's right. And weakest link is decides the whether it breaks or whether it stays. Mm-hmm. We have to be strong and keep that. Obviously, there is something good in the culture that kept on on the right path for so long. Exactly. 1400 years. Right. Okay. Because I think it's, I mean, it's worth noting for our listeners. I mean, you know, of the things, all the advice, I mean, the, the sort of gems and pearls of advice that you've given us on the show, um, you know, kind of underscore this idea of, like you said, teaching adab, like so teaching, you know, um, the manners and comportment. Um, you mentioned, uh, com- you know, like, like Farhan finding, yeah. you know, uh, classmates and, uh-huh. you know, at the MSA at mm-hmm. the university level. So the idea of making sure that your children are hanging out yeah. with other children, you know, like, m- like Muslims who yeah. are going to be of good influence. Yes. Like, so the, the idea of positive peer pressure yeah. or, or peer influence. Um, so the idea of sohba, yes. like spending time with people who are going to, you know, elevate you, not necessarily Absolutely. bring you down. So a lot of these things are cultural, right? I mean, you have to create a yeah. culture and, and what uncle, one of the things uncle hasn't mentioned or hasn't been mentioned on this show, for example, is this idea of like sort of accumulating or acquiring knowledge, not to say that you don't value knowledge, but knowledge comes but it comes, you know, it has to come from within. Yeah. Like you said, Farhan, you know, took it upon himself or any of your other children mm-hmm. to learn about Islam. But that came as a result of the Absolutely. adab and the comportment Absolutely. and the culture that you were Absolutely. able to instill Absolutely. at home. Yeah. And then he went out and, yeah. and there was that seed that was planted yeah. for him to go you, and learn you, and you, study. For you young people whose children are growing up, yeah. my sincere advice is that please, you know, in at your home, show the seriousness for the important things mm-hmm. like prayer, mm-hmm. like fasting, 
like talking to him is love and affection. Mm-hmm. Even, you know, it will have its, its effect eventually. That's okay. Right. Secondly, you know, um, do not, uh, you know, keep eye on their friends. That's very important. With this, all this technology, you have cell phone and everything. Watch out what they are doing. Absolutely. Early on. Okay. After that, after two, after 12 or 13 years old, it becomes very difficult to, you know, change the habits. That's right. Yeah, I was, I'm actually, as as a father of 12 years, I'm, I'm, I thought I had until yeah. 16, 17, no. 18, and I'm realizing no. it's really like 10, 11, 12. Yes. That's right. uh, and because it's getting earlier and earlier with... Yeah. With this uh, technology, with the world changing technology. Exactly. They have access to Google and Wikipedia. No, and absolutely. They have access to everything at their fingertips. And the other thing I think that you mentioned, Uncle, very beautifully, is um, is because of technology. Again, they are um, surround. They're you know in, in a in a virtual sense, surrounded by their peers on a 24 hour basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I didn't have that. No, we, up. we had to write, we wrote, you wrote me a we telegram wrote, letter. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> telegram letters. But even then, like when you came, when you came home from school, yeah. you left that peer group yes. and you were enveloped in your family, yes. uh, 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 culture. Yeah. Now your peer group is still knocking at 20, 24, seven and yeah, still knocking 24/7. at your, your door through technology. Yeah. I have a, I have, you know, your, your, your kids are a little younger than mine, Omer. Uh, I have a 16 or 17 year old now oh my god 17 year old daughter and i mean she's got a cell phone Mm -hmm. um but in terms of like yeah that peer group she can never we have to force her to disconnect from the peer group otherwise it doesn't happen second thing that 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 is another variable that you and i didn't have growing up if our friends wanted to engage us after hours that is to say after school hours there was always a gatekeeper pick up the phone, call, and usually your mom picked up or your dad picked up and they had to say, hey, uh, like uh-huh. uncle, or hey, hi, Mr. Ansari, <laughs> can I speak to Omar, please? You know, or, you know, your dadima, there's a funny story there, but like your friend's calling, right? Yeah. May Allah have mercy on her. Your grandmother, uh, you know, answering the phone and, you know, so having to converse with English with your, with, with, with your friends that call. But there was that gatekeeper. Now they don't, there's no gatekeeper. Yeah. Right? So anyway, um, uh, uh, Uncle, uh, sorry, even please. last thing, please. Uh, you know, uh, I asked this question many times in my khutbats, that how many times you mentioned the name Muhammad in your home last year? Mm. Mm. We rarely speak. That's so true. Unless you connect with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah by constantly mentioning, mm. look, the reason I'm using my right hand for eating mm. because it's a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Name mentioning. Then they, after... 10, 15,000 times, they know this This has to be an important person. So true. constantly mention, you know. So try to, you know, uh, give them a, a chance mm. to love him. That's a beautiful, to, beautiful love. lesson. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, Barbez, what do you think? Uh, probably a good time to... Yeah, no, I know. I, 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 yeah, sorry, there's just so much. I, I want to thank you for Uncle. I mean, I, sure. I think like, the, like, I hope that this episode underscores something that I think we don't value enough, which is yeah. we we have the opportunity, the blessing to be able to spend time with people like uncle and, you know, you, and you listeners, you have people in your communities, in your families that are older than you, that, 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 that can impart the, the, this wisdom of age, you know, um, you know, one of the companions of the prophet, he would say that there's no wisdom without experience, Absolutely. without tajruba. Yes. And I think there's, there's something, there's just invaluable there that, cannot be taught in books, which is just to be able to sit with the company of people like uncle, people who are older than you and just, just download, man, yeah. you know, to use a, a modern term, yeah. just download everything that you can from them because, you know, time is limited. I mean, you know, life is fragile and, and, you know, like I don't have my father anymore. Yeah. Um, but you know what I wouldn't trade to be able to go and spend, you know, 10 minutes with him and, or my grandparents, you know, for example. So, yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. It's not even just about, it's about, me getting time with my parents, but also I want my kids. Exactly. And because, and the other thing is I realized, man, this parenthood thing, I need all the help I can get. That's right? right. So That's right. I want them to have that connection. As There's well. an article that I saw floating around and I haven't actually, it's, it's, it's on my list. You know, you, you like download an article and you want to read it later, but it's about the failure of the nuclear family. I read that. Yeah. It's oh, a good okay. article. Yeah. We should maybe discuss that That's on the, maybe a, a forthcoming a episode. Yeah. But um, the idea that our, 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 our you know, the, the culture we come from was one of extended families. Yes. Um, and you were fortunate, Omar. And I'd love again for you to draw on those experiences because I didn't even 
didn't have that in my household. You grew up with a pers- intergenerational household. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, Your grandmother, grandmother came to live who with I you. I believe actually knew uh, uncle's mom. Is yeah. that right? She was a best friend of mine. Yes. Yes. Mashallah. Best friend of mine. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I would love for you to share those experiences, Omar, because I didn't have that. You know, like I said, my my grandparents never immigrated here. So we would go and visit them in Hyderabad every two to three years. Yeah. But you, you know, since the age of what? Like you were oh, two or no, three? No, no, oh. before I was born. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because your dada had passed away. No, your... he passed away after I was born. But okay. They were living with That's us. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Your, your paternal grandfather. And then your she became a permanent staple oh, yeah. member yeah. of your family. Yeah, absolutely. Which was beautiful because your father was an only child. It's the only reason I speak any Urdu at all. <laughs> <laughs> we have your grandmother to thank. That's right. Um, so thank you so much, listeners. Again, um, if you want to reach out, if you have questions, uh, leave a comment, feedback. We'd love to get your thoughts. Um, future episode ideas. Um, you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Um, Facebook.com slash diffuse congruence if you want to reach us on social media um, but again from the bottom of my heart and such an honor to have um, you know uh, SN Uncle on the show thank you so much thank Uncle you. thank you thank uh, and please remember to uh, remember us in your dua Inshallah. and Inshallah. the prosperity and the well-being Inshallah. of this show uh, and that may the show reach you know a broader audience and inshallah. may this message be shared um, thank you Omar as always and, yeah uh, absolutely and inshallah uncle we see you at Khutbahs at SBIA that's right inshallah. And among other other Bay Area yeah spots. for those who are local to the Bay Area you can definitely catch a Khutbah of uncles at uh, SBIA <laughs> SBI being the South Bay Islamic Association yeah, that's right. Jose for those non-Bay Area listeners <laughs> <laughs> he's always on the uh, on, on the schedule I think you're mostly at Masjid Mustafa but yes. uh, yeah yeah, uh, do do check that out as well so thank okay. you so much thanks for inviting no thank, thank you, you. Pleasure. Well, I like Thank you. Thank you.